So uh, I was having dinner with my uh, my good friend Ian here uh, yesterday, and uh, I was telling him about this video that we're doing and all the, the gear and, uh, and stuff of mix that I have. And uh, Ian reminded me that he also had some stuff uh, that was uh, still in storage at his place that, uh, that was mixed. And I, and I said, you know, could we include that in this video? And, and he uh, graciously accepted and uh, my friend Ian. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll just start. We'll just kind of show you the guitars. Uh, before we do that, we were just having a conversation. And of course, the camera wasn't rolling. Uh, and I asked you, you know, how you came to... Uh, be the uh, curator of, of these uh, instruments and mm. I think when he I think they were already at my ass well, before he died and then I think there was this, I mean things were all over the place Susie was in Asker Street in London a lot of the time you know right, right. I went over and uh, things were in flux so my, I had a house so you could put stuff at my house you know because right, right. she was running between apartments and somebody else's house so they just sort of stayed here Right. And uh, Lisa knows they're here, and Susie knows they're here. She took a couple of them. She took the last Les Paul. She took the Strat, the, what was that, like iron finish, the blue, the blue, steel blue, whatever they call oh, it. Oh, even the telly? The telly, yeah, right, yeah right. The, the telly. Right. Was that an ESP, or was it a um, Fender, you remember? No, it was a Fender. Was it? Yeah. Because yeah, I, I saw him playing a blue ESP telly body shaped uh, thing. Well, people used features. to give them us stuff. Yeah. There was a guy downtown who used to give us one each. This is one of the ones that we were given. You have his number by any chance? I could, I could use <laughs> a few free guitars. No, guys would, yeah. people would give them, you know, I guess if it's starting out and it's a new guitar, you know. Right. We right. were pretty popular at the time, so they would then give you one. I don't know where mine is, but that's the one he got. Right, right. Well, this guitar is a, it's a, basically a Strat-style uh, guitar by Bill Lawrence, who's pretty famous for his pickups. And I guess at some point, um, Bill uh, went into the guitar business like uh, a lot of guys do and, uh, and did a, a line of guitars. So this is basically a two humbucker Strat with a Kaler, which has got it dated into the 80s. Um, this is kind of neat, do not it? Yeah, that's the, the fine tuners. This, ha this is a, a trim bar. Fine tuners? Yeah, they're fine. Ooh. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it was, it's a... Not enough trying to do this without that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, when you do that, this, you can't do that. It's a, it's locked here, so then you, oh, you do the fine adjustments down here once you get it, you know. And it looks nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this this would definitely be an 80s guitar. Um, Kaler's kind of came and went with uh, Aquanet. Yeah. So... Uh, it's got a thing here, too, right? That's, that's the one that keeps it in tune, isn't it? Right, well, well what you do is you, you tune the guitar up to pitch here, and then you lock, the, lock it here, and the theory is the, guitar, uh, the strings are locked at the bridge and at the nut, and therefore, if you can whammy all the way down oh, to them yeah. flopping, and then they'll come right back to pitch because there's no place for them to. The I just to thought, you know, when a string goes, it's a major operation, you know. Well, it definitely is, and they also go out of tune because it's. Uh, uh, these are set to a spring in the back uh -huh. with tension. So if a string breaks, the tension changes, and it's like a tug of war between the strings and the and the uh, springs. Progress for you. Yeah, so if a string breaks, then all of a sudden the springs win the tug of war, and your whole guitar is now a half a pitch tuned higher. So if you're playing an A, you start, suddenly you're, Whoops. you need to go to A flat, yeah, to, you know, or G sharp, of, whatever. Yeah, a little bit of slinking is in order. Yes, you must think. But yeah, this has like all the pick scratches and stuff, so he... he Oh, he's wanged away on that from time to time. He's yeah. a bit of a mess here. So, yeah, yeah definitely did something with it. He's, he's put some miles on this one. So, mm. so this, is, this is this one. And then we're going to move to something a little bit more uh, old school. We got still with the old pick and the strings. This is a Gibson uh, ES-125. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to run the serial number to see when it was built. But these were 50s uh, and 60s student guitars, really. Yeah. Um, that Gibson put out. So this is old. Yeah, yeah. One P90 pickup, volume and a tone. Yeah. yeah. That's well old. Yeah, strip tuners, a little uh, oops here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these, yeah, these were like student guitars way back in the day. And now they're, they're, they've kind of gotten a little bit more popular, especially um, especially the, the three quarter size ones. They, uh, you know, they, they can. It's all, can, a, it's all original, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this can this could fetch, you know, up to maybe two thousand dollars to the right guy. Uh, 
not not having it belong to me. Next pick still there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I have to confess, it was inside the guitar. I heard oh, it was? And I shook it out, put it in the string. But yeah, wow. so that was a mixed pick. Um, so, you know, being that it's owned by, uh, you know, it was owned by Mick, it's certainly worth considerably more. Yeah. But, yeah. But they seem to be perfectly happy with it locked away yeah. in the basement, you know, yep. which is a shame in a way. It's a shame when you have guitars that, I have a few that cost money and you, you don't want to take them anywhere in case they get lost, you know. Yeah, or, yeah, stolen, broken. Yeah. The whole, the whole thing. Well, the traveling, you know. Well, this, uh, I would imagine he would have pulled out for I Wish I Was Your Mother. The interesting thing with all this stuff is none of it works, you know. <laughs> this doesn't work. None of them work. <laughs> Just stuff he's acquired and... He, no, well, he, he was heavy. He was heavy with. He, he didn't really regard them as instruments of wonder at all. I mean, to right. make they were things to be used, you know. Right, right. You know about all the broken heads and all the rest of it. Well, yeah, you know, we, it's pretty hard on guitar. We had a conversation when I was uh, searching, searching for the uh, Les Paul, the stripped Les Paul. Uh, it was your conversation. Uh, we were on our way to uh, pick up some Indian <clears throat> in, uh, at a restaurant by my house. And we started talking about mixed gear, and you were talking about these guitars, how you had some, and I, and I said to you, you know, the guitar that I would love to find is the stripped down Les Paul. Like any, that would be the guitar to own if you wanted to own something special that Mick owned. And, yeah. uh, and I remember your exact words were, God knows what he did with that. He probably gave it to some guy while he was crossing the street. Yeah. And you said it, to, to Mick, uh, a guitar like that is like a pencil, you know, to a writer. It's, it's a tool to use. He never really, uh, I mean, when he bought them too, I mean, the last Les Paul he bought, I was with him, and it was in Seattle or Portland, and we walked in, and he said, uh, I'll have that one, and it was just with all the others. Yeah. And it was bassy for some reason, because they're no two the same. Right. And he was moaning about it. for I said, I got the cut, you know, and I'm like, well, why didn't you try it when you were in there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to. No, yeah, I like the look of that. Big time Ronson. Yeah. That one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, God bless him. Uh but uh, so yeah, this would this would be uh, it's a just a Japanese. He'd have played "I Wish It Was Your Mother" on that and stuff like that. Yeah, that yeah. would be just your average picked up for "I Wish I Was Your Mother." Nothing else really, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I think we tried to use it at one point, uh, but uh, not something happened. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's a cool little piece, though. Just for it looks alright, doesn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Considering it's been sitting in a case for twenty years. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. There's no name on it, so I have no idea who made it, but uh, I guess it's like, a, I think, an A style. Uh, I think that's what they call this. It looks all right. I don't think it's an expensive one. I think it's nah, a cheap these, one. Yeah, these are three, four hundred bucks, uh, you know, to buy. Uh, uh, a bit of gaffer down here. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's he gone? Yeah, it was probably to tape the, the cable oh, or right. something. It looks okay. like there's been a few uh, modifications there. That <laughs> looks like a uh, hardware store. <laughs> Washer. Yeah. Plus VAT. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, so that's that. And next up is. Hurry up, because it's, it's hot in here, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I'm getting sweaty. <laughs> uh, this is being done in the midsummer. Uh, next up, now this is kind of a very cool piece. This is a early, I'm going to say this is uh, 80s definitely, but this is an early Adamus. Um, I mean, just look at the ornate headstock. You know, they, they certainly don't do that anymore. This uh, reminds me of Bearsville, the year, the, you know, when he was up there? Yeah. He lived, he lived in Woodstock, and uh, Bearsville studio looked like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. I've got a feeling that's why he probably picked that up. Yeah, there, and there's actually, there was a, a, a repair uh, thing in the case that I found. Um, they still don't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's call these guys up and go, listen, uh, not for nothing, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess he had a, a, some sort of a setup, and something got... Uh, glued back on it's it's kind of faded but uh yeah it says right across the top mick ronson uh and laurie Wu from S soncroft uh was uh picking it up for him mm -hmm. uh and paid in full paid in full by her very thank you well, Laurie. that makes a change yeah yeah and then there was some sort of i don't know if those are that's a song list or uh, uh that's the song list there's lyrics on the back yeah and then there's lyrics on the back with with chords yeah get that in there so that's uh, that's that. This Adamus is is was the, uh, and this is kind of cool too. I mean, it's got this this raised. This is like a really early one. Yeah. Um, 
But this was their like flagship line, the Adamus line that Ovation did. So this this is actually uh, would have been a, a pretty uh, expensive guitar back in the day. Yeah, I mean, what is that leather or uh, no? It's uh, it's like carved wood uh, binding. It's it's really uh, that must be worth a few bob. Yeah, and this has um, and these uh, this was a, I think a graphite top, mm -hmm. and then of course the you know the, the uh, I never like the elevation backs, you know. I don't either. They're sliding off. The, exactly. Yeah. Most people find them hard to sit with. Yeah. But uh, but when I met you, you were bad enough. You want you got to sit down and play one after all these years without it slipping. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But I, when I met you, you were playing ovations before I got you hooked on rain songs. Really? Yeah. You had no, a, uh, somebody give me one. You, you had a black ovation that you used I, to play all the time. I gave it my brother-in-law, Kevin. I couldn't, you know, this business is... Right, it? right. And then that, well, that's well, you replaced it with the rain songs that I got for you. When you've been doing it as long as I have, you really don't want to pick up a guitar, you know. Yeah. But sometimes you have to. Yeah. And when it does that, it's like, no. Yeah. That's yeah. enough to put it away. So you want one that's nice and comfy. Right. Having said that, this is a beautiful piece of work. Yeah. Van Der. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's all that, the laminate... Mm. For the for the headstock. But that looks in relatively good nick, having gone through Ronson's hands. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know, I think it's a, a setup, and uh, this would be uh, this would be still a uh, strings a bit rusty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Three, four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we got uh, last but not least. Over here. Oh, that thing, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that God. thing. I tried to tune the e, the e string several times and it just kept going back to. He kept. That's, he played this a lot. But, uh, he, yeah. He played it a lot. And it was, for a ne it was never right, you know. There was just something wrong with it. And he, and he just would not stop playing it, you know. <laughs> well, it was a challenge. <laughs> I don't know what it was. It's like, why don't you just once and for all, you know, just get it, give it to somebody. Maybe there wasn't anybody around that really knew how to do it. But he could, he could have got another one. You he know. needed a me. That's what he needed. Yeah. I could have sorted but there it weren't out. too many people. We didn't know that many people around in, in them days. You know, I mean, I don't remember knowing anybody that fixed guitars in Woodstock. Right. I'm sure there was somebody, but we didn't know them. Yeah, you think that was such a musical community? Somebody had to be servicing. I would think so, but I don't think he knew it. Uh, he was too busy uh, <laughs> being naughty. Yeah. And as far as uh, I was living in Chappaqua, well, there's nobody in Chappaqua that would do stuff like that. Right, know? right. So uh, I, that's probably why it's in the mess it's in, you know. But uh, so this. But he is used it a lot, you know. Over the years, he used it a hell of a lot. Yeah, this is a, an uh, Aquila, A Q U I L A. It's it made in Japan, you know. It's a copy of probably a you know like a Martin D twenty eight copy that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, but he just liked it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've got a Martin, but I never play it. Yeah, it's just so it's funny guitars. It's just a dreadnought, you know, with uh, probably laminated rosewood back and sides. Wood looks all right. It's just something going on with the tuning. Yeah, well, these are these are the. <clears throat> really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if he'd have brought this to me, the first thing I'd have done is put proper machine heads on it because those are uh, those aren't worth a nickel. Uh, and then, you know, done a nice setup on it, it would probably would have been fine. But that's that's. Yeah, but he was thinking, what what would that cost? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> most of the time he was skint. <laughs> well, it was it was Ronson. and I would have hooked him up. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, these are these are, you know, these are the culprit for. Uh, for that, uh, they're really cheap. And I, you know, I always notice too with, with mixed guitars, it always looked like a, a, a disaster at the headstock. They, you know, he always had his strings, you know, like they were never trimmed off, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, never bothered, never yeah, bothered. Yeah, it was just like, ah, yeah. you know. <laughs> and Ralph, McRalph, I mean, always played that where he pulled the neck back. So he had to tune accordingly. When, when Ralph plays, he pulls it like that. Yeah. There's so much pressure on it, but it goes sharp, you know. Yeah. So he's he's had to learn how to play it slightly flat to be in. Yeah, yeah. Weird. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you, you know, you're... They've all got their little indies. Uh, I mean, I told you Mick had, like, a claw. It, it wasn't, wasn't like a fingernail at all. It was like this claw. And he would go under the E string and the B string to get to the G string to bend it. Right. And I saw him doing it one day, and I... I said, why, why, why are you doing that? And he said, well, well, why would I pull all three? I've only got to pull one if I do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he so, would bend and, and he would go underneath the other strings like that. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, and the claw, because it was, his finger was really flat and this thing stuck out, you know. Yeah. 
So it sort of helped. You could slip it in there. Yeah. Mm. Great. That's not uh, not anything I would I would think of doing. It's just an odd thing that he did, you know. But it's funny. It's typical Mick, you know. Um, why are you bending like that? Well, why would I bend three strings when I've got to bend one? I mean, it's yeah. totally logical, you know. Yeah. 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 Just so, never thought about it. Yeah, it's like uh, the, the bus stuck under the bridge won't let the air out of the tires. You know, it's like that simple. They've all got these little Indian sequences, yeah. yeah. But I mean, he was classically trained. He grew up piano, violin. You know, it's, it's really a classical edge to whatever he did, you know. Right, right. Well, this is uh, this has been cool. There's, you know, we've gone through all the guitars. Uh, you want to wrap it up with. Um, your favorite Mick story? A classic Mick. Uh, There's too many of them. I, mean, <laughs> I know I've heard them all. <laughs> so I was just I just wanted to put you on the spot and see which one you'd uh, pull out. What would come to mind? No, I mean the one that immediately comes to mind is he he had one joke a year. Yeah. Which he told every night in the dressing rooms, and everybody would laugh, and he would laugh louder than anybody else. In fact, him laughing would make them laugh because the joke was pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> and as the weeks went by, it got more and more pathetic. It was like, can you go and do that somewhere else? Because it was the same every night. Yeah. The joke yeah. a year, you know. Yeah. There was millions of Mick things, but that was uh, that was the one that really got on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm. Well. All right. Ian, thanks so much. Really good lad. And uh, there you go. Now here's a picture of the guitar when it was on display in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Uh, there's you know Mick and Bowie in the you know the highlight of the uh, Ziggy thing uh, there in the background, and my good friend Ian Hunter uh, standing next to it. He, he had this shot taken for me and brought it back uh, when he was in uh, Cleveland uh, doing a doing a show uh, back somewhere between 2000 and 2002. This shot was taken. But this was the plaque that uh, they had under the guitar in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mick Ronson, electric guitar, 1968 Gibson Les Paul Custom, collection of Rick Tedesco, www.guitarhanger.com. Mick Ronson was the leader of the Spiders from Mars, David Bowie's band during his Ziggy Stardust period. After his work with Bowie, Ronson collaborated with ex Hoople frontman Ian Hunter and singers Morrissey and John Mellencamp. He died in 1993. Here's uh, just a, kind of a cool thing, really doesn't have anything to do with anything, uh, uh, except that uh, it's, it's a, uh, the, uh, the Bowie album pinup signed by all the Spiders, you know, Mick and uh, Trevor, Woody and Bowie. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Okay, these two albums I, I framed, these were actually Mix albums. Uh, he owned these, you know, they're actually, you know, obviously they're his record, but, but they, uh, he, this was his copy. Um, and this one is actually stamped, uh, not for sale, um, uh, prom promotional use only. And, you know, this one, this is a Slaughter album that is actually still sealed in the plastic. Um, this one was, uh, wasn't even open, so. Um, but those are actually mix. Okay, here we have one, two, three, four shelves full of mixed two-inch tapes. Um, they're all uh, master tapes from, um, I would say, uh, well, here you go, date 3 1977. Uh, so, you know, late 70s, I, uh, I guess when Mick was in Woodstock, 3 1977, 3 1977. Um, so when uh, Mick was in uh, Woodstock, he was at um, uh, Bearsville Studios doing a lot of recording. These are all the Bearsville logos. Uh, and there's some safeties, some backups. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I had a, a nice offer from uh, Steve Vai to, to transfer all of these over to digital, which I still may take him up on, because um, Steve's a huge Ronson fan as well. And um, just I would just love to hear the banter in between takes and stuff, you know, that, um, even if the, you know, the, the songs were just you know, the takes weren't good, just to hear the, you know, the talking back and forth and stuff would be pretty awesome. Uh, so we've got that. And then I've got one, two, three boxes of Mick's actual album covers. So when somebody, um, one of the things that I do when we do the Mick Ronson tribute guitar is I, I, I give them one of Mick's uh, albums. And what I do is I just come to a box like this and I just randomly go like that. So if you just bought a Ronson guitar, I would, you know, pull this out and you would get uh, Big Audio Dynamite, the bottom line. Um, that would be your, your album. 
Um, but there's all kinds of, uh, it was pretty, it's a pretty eclectic uh, mix of uh, music that Mick, that Mick had. And I even got some of these, which are really cool. Uh, some of these picture discs of uh, Heaven and Hall. I got a bunch of these pressings. Um, I got a couple of Def Leppard ones too. Um, that somehow Mick had. But yeah, lots of uh, lots of these these Heaven and Hall picture discs. And a um, couple of other things here. Not sure what these are. Def Leppard. Uh, okay, I guess. Well, I guess Joe probably gave these to Mick. Um, yeah, because it was uh, only after dark um, is on here. So yeah, uh, Joe probably gave these to Mick. Um, and here's. Don't look down, uh, Joe and Mick. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. So that's uh, that's my Ronson Shrine. That's uh, that's a lot of the uh, a lot of the cool stuff. A lot of this I got all of this pretty much except the guitar from Susie when uh, she was moving from a house back into an apartment in the city. They you know they had a house out in Long Island. And um, it was just too much stuff to, to cart around, and she didn't want to put it in storage. Uh, so she had to part with it, and, uh, and I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, and uh, she called me, and, you know, she wanted it to go. I think she wanted it to go somewhere where she knew where it would be at all times, and then it wouldn't just, you know, get all parted out and scattered all over the world, uh, especially these tapes and stuff. So, so I just bought it all. So there you go. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video, and... Um, Long live Mick.